Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an Impressionist Realist Painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosson of Steve Brosson's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde J.K.L. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, botanicals, birds, and whatnot. The tight illustrated pan and watercolor, tin and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. Well, hello, and welcome to the broadcast. This is the Artist Friends podcast, and my name is Clyde J. Kale, and this is episode 60 for August the 31st. Uh, my apologies for we skipped last week. I had a little bit of a private issue I had to deal with, but I am now back and energi- I'm energized, and I am here with my two best artist friends, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. Hello, Diane. Hi, Constance. Hello, everyone. Hello, Constance. Hello, Diane. Hi, Clyde. Hello, everybody. All right. So we are back at it again. And this week, which should have been last week, (laughs) the theme was I ran across a uh, documentary video about uh, Edward Hopper. And it was called uh, Edward Harper in the Blank Canvas. It was on YouTube. And then I, I ran across a documentary about Salvador Dali. And these two are two completely different artists. And that's what struck me. Kind of like they're uh, uh, completely different styles, completely different life. and But both of them had a profound influence on society and culture. And that's what uh, kind of impressed me. With uh, Edward Harper, Diane, you want to start the conversation off about Edward Harper, your your opinions or thoughts about him? Edward Harper, he his a lot of his work was very um, simple. I guess I want to say it, it was. It made you stop and like try to figure out what was going on, because there was usually a single. Um, person in an empty space or um it was very i don't know how to describe his work but um so he he himself was kind of an outsider i guess and i he he did a lot of windows where he was looking in from the outside and into people's lives and i think you know a lot of that kind of was how he felt about things um one of my professors in college actually does goes up to his um, house in, I think it's in Maine every year, and does an artist in residence thing there. Wow. So he has a lot of, um, Hopper is one of his like favorites. <laughs> so he, he spends the summer up there a lot of time, or I guess every year, I don't know how many, you know, how much time, a week, a week or a month or whatever. And um, his work is very similar to, Hoppers, but um, 
what made me think of Hopper was the previous week, you know, we had that video uh, that was talking about the, uh, uh, the some of the, the, the artists in the cities, you know, and everything. And uh, Constance happened to mention, said, wasn't he the artist that used to look in the people's windows as he, ro- as he rode the, uh, the, uh, trains, the subway and trains. Yes. And that's what made me think of Edward, Edward Harper. It, it was Edward Harper that did, you know, that, that did that. And uh, when he was young, you know, he was working in, in New York City. And uh, if you look at his work, and you can see what that life experience influenced his work. Because you're right, it's all, a lot, all of it is, you know, like looking into a window and everything. But this documentary uh, also what impressed me when I said inf- his, how he influenced culture was so much, so many uh, film directors and later on who made their movies were influenced and inspired by Edward Harper's work. And I didn't realize that, you know, and during the documentary when they started, you know, I had some of those directors who came up and were talking about that. When I think back, yes, like the my favorite Ed, Edward Harper is the uh, the one with the, it's called the Nighthawks, where it's the most famous you know, painting, where it's just like it looks like a like a uh, a, a restaurant, and it just has the th- three people that are in the restaurant at night, you know, and and nineteen uh, forties you know style, and but a lot of the uh, it's inter- he was influenced by the noir type films the uh you know the 1940s dark thriller mystery detective films cuz that that you can see that camp comes out in in his artwork but at the same time he turned around and influenced later you know, had an influence on later directors you know and movie makers and everything so i found that very interesting so which is why i said he you know uh influenced the culture uh constance you want to Got to add some opinions of Edward Hopper, or yeah, I like his work. Is is um he make it's, it's nice, clear statements that he makes, and it he likes to make you think about what's going on in maybe in that person's life, or you know, it to just when you look at his paintings, you it makes you pause and think about about you know about uh you know what was he thinking about what was he you know but he he must have traveled a lot which he did you know back and forth to work like it said but um i like that i like his work because it's like bare bones it's bare bones you know and yeah it gives you it gives you room to to interpret which is what you know people like to do you know is uh make up your own and think about well i wonder what that person's life was in that painting you know so make up yeah. your own stories from from your mm-hmm. yeah and everything yes yes constance that that is that's the impression i got from uh, edward hopper now he pretty much lived a normal clean life you know and and nothing really fantastic or or extraordinary or controversial about his life and everything. Let's go to Salvador Dali, <laughs> which is the complete opposite. <laughs> He's Mo- quite a character. <laughs> Most people. And I, I think I, some of the, what he, what they talked about with him, I, I'm wondering if he, is the reason that a lot of people think artists are a little crazy and and out there <laughs> because he definitely was. That was a really influence a lot of like Andy Warhol and the, you know he he had a definite influence on 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 uh, their work and jo- Jackson Pollock and everything because you could you could see it. Salvador Dali influenced a lot of of artists later later in life, you know and. Uh, and his, you know, imitating his li- lifestyle and everything, and he, uh, his showmanship, you know, if you want to refer to it. And um, what impressed me about most importantly about the documentary on Salvador Dali 
was in his youth, he had come across at this at the time he could not express it in words, but he had come across the golden mean. The golden and he was spent most of his life trying to express the golden mean that the geometric, the mathematical structure of nature and and he uh which i didn't know this about yeah until until they and then when i look back at his paintings and everything yes i could see it he's and the his flamboyant life and everything was just part of the deal of, of him you know trying to to you know just want to you know to sell his artwork because once he reached a certain point he had to continue it you know to everybody expected that from him yeah mm -hmm. yeah it goes with that old adage that you know like pollock and some of the other artists who get thomas kincaid that got into that you know knit niche work and yeah, pigeonholed or whatever with the mm -hmm. case, case so he, i think that dolly from the looks of it he enjoyed being pigeonholed in, into a niche you know yes which works for a lot of artists and if you like that that's uh you know, because his work was very interesting, even though he was in a niche. I mean, he doesn't, you know, he was very creative with his niche. <laughs> yep. But that, but, but that impressed me with the, uh, you know, him searching for the, you know, for the golden me mm -hmm. to, to establish that. And, and to put that in his artwork and everything. Um, as a kid, I liked Salvador Dali's work. About the, I didn't like all of his work, but the one piece is, uh, I forget the name of it, but the, uh, with the, the clocks that are all melting and it looks like in the, the desert, you know. That's probably his most famous piece. I don't know. Yes, yes, his most famous piece. Yeah, I don't know, don't remember the title of it, but, uh, um, and I, the more I think about it, okay, I have certain artists that I like. I like I like their work for a certain way, uh, certain aspects of it, and certain parts of their life and whatnot, like Van Gogh and everything. But I never really try to imitate them. I did when I was younger, but now, in my works now, uh, Salvador Dali has had an indirect influence on in all my work to this day. When I, after watching that documentary, I went back and looked at a lot of, you know, stuff. Even to this day, there is a Salvador Dali aspect to my work, very much so. And it just, it blew me away. I didn't realize it. I did not realize it until I, in fact, I just got an email today uh, notifying me that uh, two pieces of my artwork have been accepted into an online exhibition for the uh, patterns and textures. And I submitted two of my early watercolors, which were very much Salvador Dali, like a a a, a couple of roses with a melted clock underneath and triangles behind, and then another one I called a, I called Blue Jay Fantasy with a blue jay and flowers floating in the air, look like they're coming through a window. <laughs> those are Salvador Dali, like I mean, those are. <laughs> And when I was creating them, I never realized it at the time. I did not intentionally have, well, I'm going to create something like Salvador Dali in my mind when I created those pieces. Those are Salvador Dali's all the way, you know. And after watching this video about him, I and then I looked at some of my other stuff earlier, my acrylics, and now my oil paint. I said, oh, my God, this guy has truly influenced my artwork. <laughs> but what... Uh, struck me with Salvador Dali was when I mentioned the, the objective of the, the influence of culture. The video also talked about how you know, he's influenced pop design, mod, you know, the, in the design world, world and the creation of furniture and the building, building of houses. And, and he had such a profound influence on architects and, and sculptors and, you know, you don't you, you don't realize you, you know you really don't until you look at it real closely 
you know, he had a very profound, you know, effect. So all of his flamboyancy aside, you know, and people say, when you see Salvador Dali, they see that. But the art people, the art people who are, you know, who are educated in art, see the serious side, his, you know, serious work and everything. Okay, Diane, you want to add anything to that since I went on and on? <laughs> I can see how it would have affected you especially since you're kind of into the older films and stuff too. I, and he kind of um, like worked with Hitchcock and stuff doing some things. So I can see where it would have been attractive to you because that's kind of, you, you're into that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I think he kind of took things outside the box more than was happening at the time. And it, it opened the door for, other artists to explore further than they had been used to. And it made it okay to do that. Like, you know, since he was successful at it. Yep. So it was absolutely Constance. What do you think about Salvador Dali? I, I like his work, you know, because I do like abstracts and stuff. And, uh, but I don't know that his work has really ever influenced my work. Um, but, He's a character. Um, he has, you know, him and his wife both work together to, to really attract attention to Zella's work. But yeah, I've always liked his work. I, I've never really, you know, understood it, but he's always been his work. I like his work. Yeah, his. Uh, we won't even go down that side. His personal life. Oh boy. Well, his wife is 20, 20 years older than him or something like that. He's colorful. Let's put the word this side out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I, and I also included a, what I call a funny clip where he was on the Dick, the, uh, yeah, Dick Cavett show. Yeah. And it was so interesting. He started out. Of course, you know, he just came out with a, well, he had a lemur from the zoo. He just threw it threw at him. Yeah. An anteater. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was, yeah. And uh, um, he started out trying to express his go-to-mean theory. And, of course, Dick Cavett and the other people there, they did not, I mean, you could tell. It was way over their head what he was trying to, he was trying to talk serious. But then, of course, it's very hard to understand. His accent was very strong, and he was very hard to yeah. understand. It definitely had a, a heavy, uh, heavy accent, very heavy. Yep. And uh, then there was a uh, who was a uh, that actress. Uh, uh, I don't remember for Gillian Gish or whatever. When she tried to be polite to him. <laughs> I like that. He just blew her off. <laughs> and you can see an expression on her face. She was frustrated, you know. <laughs> she was trying to, I think, kind of in her own way, flirt with him a little bit, you know, to make the program interesting, but he was having none of it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it was, it, I thought it was kind of funny. Poor Dick Cavett. He didn't know what to think, you know. <laughs> I don't think he understood half of what he was saying. No, I don't think he did. No, he was having a hard time with him. Yeah. Well, they just went the other. Just the, they went the other route. The comp, you know, just the flamboyancy and you know, and 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 whatnot. And uh, when he did his signature real quick, and <laughs> chicken, chicken, yeah, chicken scraw and made an original Salvador Dali for him. Which is the thing about it. That little chicken scraw is probably worth several thousand dollars, millions of dollars now. Yeah, Dick Cavett or his estate. Yeah. Has, has it in their <laughs> Yeah, but uh, for the longest time now, I, I, I liked his work, but I never understood because, you know, I could duplicate that. I said, how come it was – considered you know valuable and they were calling him a genius you know and everything and i was under the impression that a lot of people are well it's just because he's flamboyant and his showmanship that 
no, when you really look at his artwork, his artwork is very serious and very much of uh, he was following the golden mean, and which is why, because see, the thing about the golden mean, when you look at a painting that an artist has tried to implement that, um, if it hits you, it hits you at a certain level, then that's why it does, because the golden mean is, uh, on a spiritual sense, you know, it's, it's the, the natural ordering of, of the world. You know, it's, as they say, it's the touch of God, you know? So when, as, so when you look at, at artwork that follows that and you're attracted to it, because we're all, I don't want to get real religion, but we're all, as humans, we're all naturally attracted to God or our nature, you know? And, and so um, that impressed me with Salvador Dali, you know, and everything. Well, he's so flamboyant and, and everything, and it seemed like a total contradiction that he was following the golden mean, because it's, it's, so, it's such a structured way of, looking at the world like and you know in nature and stuff so structured and yet he seems like he's the total opposite of that like right you know he does because his but his abstracts are so great because i mean think about some of the creatures that he has in his brain that he put on the canvas i mean his his creatures are very 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 interesting and strange at the same time you know so and he was influenced by where he grew up. And I thought it was really interesting when they were going through and showing like, you know, the, the rock formations, you know, that were in, they were in his paintings he had duplicated what he saw as a boy, you know, that's, yeah, it looks like a, like a desolate desert, but off in that corner is that big rock formation, which was identical to where he grew up <laughs> along the, along the coast. You know, so I, I, I just, you know, I'd always heard of Salvador Dali, but I, you know, never really, uh, uh, understood, you know, understood him except for, you know, I always, I thought he was a nutcase, you know, it was, and I, I saw that side of him, you know, and everything. And what is so interesting is when I say to me, what struck me was these two artists, they're opposites. But they have such a profound influence on our culture, you know, in their own right, in their own way. Yeah, I found that to be very, you know, interesting. That's why I picked to uh, for our discussion. You know, th those two, they're they're opposites, but they really profoundly inf influence uh, our culture. And um, as an example, okay, you know, I you know I run an old time radio. You know, I mean, I'm a passion for that and everything, and when I talk to ordinary people who don't listen to radio and I say something about it, oh, you mean those programs like uh, what's that one called the shadow with that creepy voice? They know one particular show that they have heard. When you talk to an ordinary person who really is not into art and you mention them about, oh, so you mean like Salvador Dali or Picasso? They know these the, because these people have had these artists have had such a profound influence on culture and the average ordinary non-art person knows who they are. Mm -hmm. They may not understand them, but they know who they are and everything. And I think as, as a, uh, as a working artist, uh, that's a goal. That's a worthy goal. Now I am not going to go down the route of the flamboyant Salvador Dali and some of his other <laughs> But I hope that when I pass from this earth, I hope that my art will achieve a level, a certain level to where it will maybe influence, you know, uh, culture and everything. And my radio programs, that's been my objective for my radio, not just entertainment, you know, providing uh, entertainment for, uh, you know, folks to, uh, uh, especially it's been very profoundly during our, this coronavirus. You know, I've had so many emails of people told me that I've uh, provided a source for them to relax and forget about their problems. Um, but on the other hand, I also have a lot, a lot of young listeners who are aspiring writers 
and these programs inspire inspire them and put ideals and and you know, give them the ideals and motivate them in their writings i've had so many emails from that you know that uh so uh that you know when i said i want to influence culture i've done it on that aspect of it <laughs> just by but you never know how you're going to affect people and how um, you know how many people we, you will affect and now and, and in what ways you're going to do that it's like so you know it's kind of how your show is it's like you're, you're yeah. you realize in ways you don't know yep and and that's why that's a responsibility uh, as artists since we have this this talent and that's why we are we it, it's our responsibility to put our artwork out there too many people think of uh well you know i'm not good enough or well i'm not selling you know but the fact that you if you actively continue uh, uh creating the artwork and then putting it out there to the world like diane said you never know maybe some kid or somebody who is having a hard time in their life and they're thinking about suicide and they happen to come across your painting, Diane or Constance or me, and it completely changes their life. We don't really know, you know, we really, don't know. so I think that is a great responsibility for us as working artists is to continue creating our work and to continue putting it out there. It'd be nice if we sell something once in a while, obviously, <laughs> but, but the, yes, just the, the, the activity, the, uh, you know, so no, maybe someday we'll be as famous as Salvador Dali or as Edward Hopper. But on the other hand, maybe, you know, if our works of art, uh, inspire and lift the spirits of uh, folks then uh, that will satisfy me if i come to realize that i've done that then i'm happy yeah i would like to get some money but hey oh well <laughs> well it's nice to be able to to um make enough money to keep buying art supplies <laughs> yeah. you know buy art supplies food or art supplies uh yeah. Yeah, that loaf of bread or that tube of paint. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's wrap this up. I didn't take a uh, message break, but uh, we'll do that next time. <laughs> we were getting in too far into the discussion to uh, to have a, a a good break. Folks, you've been listening to the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 60 for August the 31st, the last day of August. And I have been here with Constance Bronson and Diane Hunt. And I'm going to say good night, Diane. Good night, Constance. And I'll let Diane, you say good night to everybody. Hi, everyone. Good night, Constance. Constance? Good night, everybody. Good night, Clyde. Good night, Diane. Good night, folks. And... Please, however you hear these podcasts, give us a thumbs up. Give us some star ratings. Let us send us some love. Let us know that you enjoy them. Good night, everybody. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde Jade Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde J. Kim. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com Constance Bronson at www.etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C-B-R-O-S-N-A-N-S Clyde J. Kim at w www.cjkaleartworks.com If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends Podcast, please email cjkale at sign mystery-otr.com If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or star rating. And most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons license.